I have always had an extreme fascination with the roguelike genre. There's something compelling about a game that asks so much of its players, forcing them to replay it again and again until they've mastered every system that the game has to offer. One thing I have come to appreciate about roguelikes is their approach to progression systems, and I'm not talking about the kind that lets you permanently level up your character for future runs. I'm talking about how your character changes within each run. Roguelike progression is fascinating because it takes systems typically found in multi-hour games and puts them into games that typically can be beaten in a far shorter amount of time, at least on a successful attempt. Progression systems are how you go from this to this within the space of one run. Today I would like to take a closer look at roguelike progression to see the significant variation within the roguelike genre. Before moving on with the rest of the video, I want to clarify what I mean by roguelike, because this is a surprisingly contentious term. For the purposes of this video, a roguelike is any game that has random level generation and permanent player death that does not allow the player to carry powers into new runs. Roguelike purists would argue that many of the games I will be talking about today aren't roguelikes, but are instead roguelites because they aren't close enough to the template laid out by the original rogue. You are a roguelite. You are the real roguelike. Now you're an action figure. You are a child's plaything. You are a sad, strange little man, and you have my pity. Farewell. However, just like how modern Metroidvanias aren't exactly like Metroid or Castlevania, Modern roguelikes are not going to be exactly like the original rogue, so labeling these games as roguelites just because they don't feature turn-based dungeon crawling is a bit ridiculous in my opinion. If you don't agree with me on this point, it shouldn't change any of my actual arguments if you want to think of these as roguelikes or roguelites. And also, if you want to be really nitpicky, a couple of the games I will be mentioning don't quite fit my definition of roguelike because they do allow you to carry upgrades from one run to another. However, these permanent upgrades aren't a huge part of these games, and so for the sake of discussion, I won't be factoring these elements into my graphs. For the purpose of this video, a progression system is the web of interrelated mechanics that influence the power of the player character. Any item, upgrade, buff, curse, debuff is part of the progression system. As you can imagine, keeping track of an entire game's progression system could get complicated really quickly, so I developed a method of visualizing in-game progression systems to make it easier to compare and contrast the structures of any particular game's progression. To demonstrate how these diagrams work, let's take a look at the diagram for Downwell. Downwell is a pretty simple game. The player can jump, move, and shoot. These abilities on their own don't do anything to the player's power level. But they can be used contextually to perform actions that do make the player more or less powerful. Any action which changes the player's power level is represented on this graph, and the effects of these actions are shown by the branching trees below them. For instance, bopping an enemy will give the player some gems and increase their combo. The diamonds are representative of a fork in the path, where only one outcome will happen. Or if you want to be a computer science major, these are OR gates. For instance, when entering an upgrade room, the player will either encounter an upgrade that gives them health, OR charge, but not both at the same time. Additionally, some parts of this graph are so interconnected that drawing them out completely would make the graph spaghetti. To prevent this, I've decided to use colors to represent some connections. For example, a lot of elements feed into Downwell's health system. Sustaining a combo, collecting an upgrade, and buying an item can give you health. To show how all of these effects lead into the health system, I've colored any instance where the player gains health red, as well as the health system itself. The red color is a less messy stand-in for the arrows that would be connecting these points. Now that I have explained my system for graphing out a roguelike's progression, let's compare the progression graphs for many roguelikes to see how developers design progression that fits the needs of their particular game. Oh. 
because I've already mentioned it, let's start with Downwell. Downwell is one of the most tightly designed roguelikes I have ever played, largely because of its progression. The most interesting part of Downwell's progression graph is the combo system, which exists to make the most interesting way to play also the best way to play. The system is really quite simple. If the player bops an enemy, their gun boots are refilled and their combo increases. If the player bops 8 enemies, they will earn 100 gems when they land. If they bop 15 enemies, they will get 100 gems and an additional charge when landing. The largest reward is given for a combo of 25, which gives the player 100 gems, a charge, and a health. Players could casually meander down the well with slow, precise, boring jumps, but doing so would mean that they miss out on all the free upgrades that they could be earning by flying through the well frantically, bouncing from enemy to enemy. I also think the downwell health system is really clever. In most games, using a healing item at full health is just wasteful. In roguelikes where healing items cannot be saved for later, spending money to heal is pointless when at full health. If this is the case, when the player is forced to choose between a pointless health upgrade or something they can actually use, it isn't actually going to be that difficult of a choice. Downwell's health system is brilliant because healing items are always useful, even if the player is at full health, because for every 4 health they gain while at max health, they can increase their maximum health by 1. Because health is always somewhat useful, players can never write off healing items entirely. Without the system, skilled players would just dump all of their money into charge upgrades when at full health. The key takeaway is this. When every choice is a valid choice, the player will be forced to make deeper, more interesting decisions. This is a pattern you will see across many games with good progression systems. In my opinion, Spelunky is one of the most important roguelikes of all time. The release of Spelunky was one of the first times a developer had taken the core ideas pioneered by early roguelikes and applied them to a genre not typically associated with random generation and permadeath. Spelunky guy is fragile and the world is harsh. Many enemies and hazards can end a run instantly or mess the player up if they aren't paying attention. This difficulty is very intentional, and it affects how the player interacts with the progression system. Derek Yu describes health as Spelunky's most valuable currency. He wanted health to feel precious, so the game only gives you 4 hearts at the start. The value of health is further reinforced by Spelunky's progression system. In Spelunky, almost all of the player's healing will come from damsels, which will give the player 1 health if the damsel is brought to the end of the level. What makes this system interesting is how the damsel interacts with the other game systems. There are two kinds of items in Spelunky. Stackable items that once found will always stay with the player, and items that the player can only carry around one of at a time. Damsels fall into the second category, meaning that if the player wants to get the damsel to the end of the level, they will need to drop whatever they were carrying to do so. The player might have to choose between the damsel or their powerful shotgun. The damsel's interconnectedness extends beyond the carry system. Throughout the game, players can find Kali altars where they can sacrifice bodies for rewards. Any body can be sacrificed, but damsels are the most valuable bodies. However, sacrificing a damsel means that the player cannot turn them in for health. The damsel's design facilitates the creation of interesting choices because she is integrated into the rest of the progression system, beyond her ability to heal the player. The shop system also integrates the rest of the game systems. Throughout the game, players can randomly find shops where they can buy useful items with the gold they have been collecting throughout the game. These shops incentivize the player to take actions to get more gold. Firstly, the players will want to explore each level to get as much gold as they can. However, if the player spends too much time in the level, a ghost will appear, 
if the ghost catches the player, they are instantly killed, so it provides a good incentive to be hasty with exploration. However, the ghost also provides interesting opportunities. If the ghost touches a gem, it will turn into a valuable diamond. Skilled players might try abusing this to get as much money as possible. Golden idols extend this risk-reward dynamic even further. Idols give the player a lot of money, but collecting an idol will trigger a deadly trap. Without the shop, players wouldn't interact with any of these systems and they would just make a beeline for the exit because without the shop, gold is useless. However, the Spelunky shop is a bit more than a simple currency sink. As you can see from our graph, there is another way that the player can get the items inside. If the player is feeling bold, they can fight the shopkeeper, who is literally the most powerful character in Spelunky. Hello darkness, my old friend. If the player manages to emerge from the fight alive, they will be handsomely rewarded with all of the items in the shop, a corpse perfect for sacrifice, some gold, and most importantly, a shotgun, one of the most powerful items in the entire game. Of course, murder is no light act, and for the rest of the game, there will be a hostile shopkeeper waiting for the player at the end of every level. This shop system is brilliant because the player always has a choice to make. In most games, if the player doesn't have enough money to afford an item, they don't have any choice but to move on without that item, which isn't a very interesting choice because it isn't really a choice at all. In Spelunky, the player will always be presented with a choice, which is why the shop system is so brilliant. Faster Than Light, which I will now abbreviate to FTL, is another early roguelike that is similar to Spelunky in some ways, but operates under a completely different progression philosophy. While the progression system in Spelunky was always there to lend the player a helping hand, it is technically optional. A skilled Spelunky player could realistically get through the game without taking a single upgrade. In FTL, your enemies will always be getting stronger, and there are some attacks which are unavoidable. In order to deal with the tough late game enemies, you need to upgrade your ship to some extent. FTL's mandatory progression forces the player to upgrade if they want to have any chance to survive late game fights. Mandatory and optional progression are both distinct styles, but neither is inherently better than the other, and they both have their own unique design considerations. While a varied and interesting progression system is important for optional progression games, it is even more important in mandatory progression games because the game necessitates its use for survival. With that in mind, let's take a look at FTL's progression system. Resource management is the name of the game in FTL. Not only are there more resources to manage than in Spelunky, but these resources play a larger role in the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. If a Spelunky player runs out of bombs or rope, they can still win. In FTL, if the player does a poor job managing their four main resources, they will almost certainly lose. Whenever the player wants to move to the next system, they need to spend fuel. After running out of fuel, the player can only sit and wait for help to arrive. This allows the rebel fleet to catch up to the player, and it leaves them vulnerable to attack from pirates and other unsavory folk. Because of these powerful disincentives, fuel becomes a very valuable resource, even though it usually cannot be spent for other upgrades and it serves no use in combat. Missiles are very valuable because they are unaffected by shields, and thus are very useful for eliminating specific systems during a battle. Running out of missiles usually isn't as dire as running out of fuel, as long as the player plans for it. Some weapon loadouts can get away without using missiles at all, as long as the player takes the time to think ahead and set up those loadouts. However, some ships don't start with missile weapons, so missiles are useless to these players. 
at least until they can install a missile weapon. Drones are similar to missiles, but they are more specialized than missiles because they require a special station and some ship power to operate. Because of this, in most of my runs I end up ignoring drones entirely, because equipping my ship with drones is going to significantly cut into my funds for other upgrades. Just like missiles, there isn't really a way to reliably use drones outside of their use in combat. Drones are a loadout dependent currency, with a low amount of systemic integration. They will be really interesting for some players, but they won't result in any interesting choices for most players. If the player can use drones, they will take them, but otherwise they will ignore them. Drones, and to a lesser extent missiles, don't lead to interesting choices because players largely won't be using them, so getting a drone is sort of pointless in terms of progression. Outside of combat, players can spend scrap to upgrade their ship systems, which include engines, shields, weapons, power, and other utilities. In Spelunky, gold can only be spent in shops, which randomly appear throughout the game. If FTL players could only upgrade at specific, randomly chosen points, they might be left in a situation where they're thrown into a tough fight without being given an opportunity to upgrade their ship, which would feel unfair. FTL feels fair because it allows the player to upgrade their ship at any time, so if the player ever has an underpowered ship, it is their own fault. Additionally, the player can spend scrap in shops. Shops sell weapons, crew, augmentations, and systems. In addition to these upgrades, shops are always guaranteed to sell missiles, drones, and fuel, which gives the player a reliable way to stock up on these important resources. Shops are the only reliable source of healing in the game, which makes them much more important for a successful run than the Spelunky shop. Making scrap such a versatile currency was a great move. There are a lot of places in the progression graph where the player can spend scrap, and the player probably won't have enough scrap for everything. This forces players to make strategic choices about how to best spend their scrap. For instance, should the player spend scrap to heal their ship, or should they spend that scrap to upgrade the shield system? The decisions the player makes extend into the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. There are three encounter types in FTL, and all of them interact with the progression system to some extent. Players spend their missiles and drones to deal damage to the enemy. One thing that makes FTL fights unique among roguelikes is that, occasionally, the enemy will offer to pay the player to stop fighting. However, the player can choose to continue fighting to get more scrap. However, accepting the bribe typically gives the player access to more rare or interesting resources. Players can also be put into choose-your-own-adventure style scenarios where the player can make a choice and may or may not be rewarded or punished for their choice. These scenarios are weird because sometimes the player knows the outcome of their choice beforehand, but more often than not, the outcome is unknown to the player, and is many times randomly selected. While the subject of randomness is very complicated, I think the implementation of these scenarios is poor in the context of the progression system, because as I have established, FTL is all about the balance of resources, and making smart choices with your limited supply. Because the player doesn't know what they stand to gain or lose from these choices, it is hard for them to make strategically informed decisions. Progression through this graph is very important in this game, so it matters what resources you receive from the various scenarios. But, because the player cannot always be certain, their ability to skillfully navigate this graph is undermined. Overall, there are a lot of things to like about the FTL progression system. Its central currency is used to encourage interesting decisions because of its versatility, and the ability to upgrade at any time fits the game's nature as a mandatory progression system. That said, I feel like FTL is held back by its random scenarios and its loadout dependent resources, which are effectively worthless for certain kinds of players.
Since I was so critical of FTL's progression, I feel it is only fair that I take a look at the developer's next game, because I feel that its progression system is tremendously improved. Into the Breach is an excellent turn-based strategy game where the player is fighting off aliens and eventually taking the fight to their own home. Almost all of the building damage in this game can be avoided by good tactical planning, so the onus is on the player to avoid and deal damage, not the progression system, making Into the Breach more of an optional progression roguelike. The core gameplay is as follows. The player chooses an island, where they then choose missions. Each mission requires the player to defend buildings from aliens because every time a building is damaged, the player loses power. If the player runs out of power, they lose. Additionally, each mission offers optional objectives which reward the player with useful goodies. After a certain number of missions, players do a boss mission, which if completed, lets the player spend their reputation to buy items, grid power, and reactors. Into the Breach's optional objectives exist to encourage high-level mastery of the game's tactical systems. Avoiding all damage isn't terribly difficult. But avoiding power damage while also protecting optional objectives will push the player to the limit. Because these optional objectives are so difficult, when the player pulls through and achieves them, it feels rewarding because the battle was hard won. It also helps that the rewards earned from these optional objectives are always useful to the player, unlike the resources in FTL. Power missions effectively reward skillful players with a free heal, and even if the player is at full health, Power can still be useful because earning power at full health increases your grid defense, increasing the likelihood that an alien's attack will be completely nullified in the future. As I said before, reputation is spent in the shop, giving the player a way to turn their strategic aptitude into new items. Interestingly, reputation can only be spent in the shop, and it cannot be transferred from one island to another, which removes some of the larger level progression choices that the player might be forced to make in FTL. But ultimately, this currency fits the more tactical nature of Into the Breach's gameplay. Reactors are a resource that allows the player to increase their mech power. Mech power lets the player use new weapons, improve their old weapons, or increase the mech's speed or HP. Reactors are extremely valuable, so it makes sense that the missions offering reactors are substantially more difficult. These difficult missions create interesting risk-reward dynamics, where the player is tempted with a lot of goodies, but getting them means that they are more likely to take damage in the fight. The tension between progress and difficulty can be very compelling, if executed properly, and fortunately, Into the Breach manages to pull it off. For the most part, I have been analyzing progression systems that I feel are pretty good, even if they aren't perfect. I cannot honestly say that the next game's progression impressed me at all. Sky Rogue is a flight sim roguelike, and while this concept has a lot of potential, unfortunately I feel that the game makes a lot of decisions that make it feel repetitive over multiple runs. Roguelikes have a lot of ways that they can keep themselves interesting over several runs. Sometimes, roguelikes can design a combat system that is so deep and satisfying, it can support the entire game. Some roguelikes lean into emergent mechanics to constantly surprise the player with interesting systemic quirks. Some roguelikes focus on unique level generation algorithms, so no two levels feel the same. Most importantly for this video, some roguelikes design expressive progression systems that allow for a wide range of unique playstyles. Sky Rogue fails in all of these areas. The combat in Sky Rogue can get repetitive quickly because almost all of the enemies are functionally identical with little variation. The combat doesn't lead to any interesting emergent properties either. Every interaction is just shooting or avoiding attacks from enemies from long distances, which isn't conducive to creating unexpected systemic properties. Sky Rogue randomly generates a new set of islands every game, but this doesn't matter because this is a flight simulator, so 99% of the action is going to take place in the sky, which is going to be the same every single game. Sky Rogue's final hope is its progression system, but this fails to add variety for a couple of reasons. The vast majority of roguelikes design progression systems where the player can find different items on different runs, which forces the player to adapt with the items that they are given and play in different ways. Sky Rogue doesn't work like this because players have access to every single item from the start of a run, 
meaning there is nothing to unlock throughout the run. Players can, after every mission, visit the shop to upgrade their items. These upgrades don't change the items in any meaningful way, because the changes are all quantitative, and quantitative changes are almost always less interesting than qualitative changes. The entirety of the Skyrogue progression system actually reminds me a lot of the ship upgrades in FTL, but without the good parts. For instance, upgrading a ship system in FTL is going to feel more impactful, because it actually is impactful. Upgrading your weapon system is more interesting because this upgrade might allow the player to bring a new weapon into the next fight, which makes a huge difference. On the defensive side, the difference between one shield layer or two shield layers could be the difference between taking damage or not taking damage. It is also important to note that the FTL ship upgrades are only one part of a much larger progression system that can provide variety across several playthroughs, even though it doesn't change from game to game. The Sky Rogue upgrades might make your plane slightly faster, or your attacks more damaging, but the plane will feel pretty much the same before and after the upgrade. It also doesn't help that the shop will never change from game to game, so you don't even get the variety of seeing different items across different playthroughs. As tedious as the Sky Rogue shop is, I don't feel it is the game's biggest mistake. Progression systems always incentivize certain behaviors. In a well-designed game, the best way to play will usually happen to be the most fun way to play. Taking a look at Skyrogue's graph, we can see that it is very bare-bones, and killing enemies is the only thing that gives the player more money, and money is the only thing that the player can use to make their planes more powerful. The later levels are pretty difficult, so the player is going to want every advantage that they can get. So, if the player wants the best odds possible, they will need to hunt down every last major structure on the early levels so they can be prepared for the later levels. This task isn't difficult because the building usually cannot fight back, so there's no risk involved. Under the lens of flow theory, destroying buildings is going to put the player into boredom, because the odds of actually failing to destroy a building are practically non-existent. The tedium is compounded by the fact that destroying a building can be an extremely slow process. As a result, early levels become extremely drawn out and boring, but skilled players will always take the time to grind out money for upgrades, because if they don't, they are intentionally handicapping themselves. As a rule of thumb, when designing a game, assume that players will play in the most optimal method, especially when designing for such a difficult genre, where one mistake can wipe out all of a player's progress. Designing with the assumption of optimal play will ensure that the play experience will remain interesting for the most skilled and dedicated players. Over time, all of your players will become skilled at the game, so you want to make sure that the high-level play doesn't devolve into a few tedious strategies. It also ensures that high-level players won't find an exploit that undermines the challenge of the game, but that is a discussion for another day. There are a lot of approaches roguelikes employ to stop the player from tediously combing the level for every resource they can find. Some make it physically impossible to find everything. For instance, if the player misses some gems in Downwell, they cannot jump high enough to get back, so their only choice is to move on. Another common approach is increasing the difficulty as time goes on. The Spelunky Ghost or the Invisible Ink Alarm level are both good examples of systems that will eventually kill the player if they don't move fast enough. Skyrogue tries to use the latter approach, by eventually spawning reinforcements, but this doesn't work because these reinforcements are mortal. The Spelunky Ghost is terrifying because it is immortal and it can instantly kill the player. This makes the ghost an actual threat. The Sky Rogue reinforcements are just normal enemies that the player can kill, and once the reinforcements are dead, the game has nothing to push the player forward, and the player is free to grind out money to their heart's content. Sky Rogue shows the importance of limiting player progression to some extent. The player has access to every upgrade in the game, and all the time in the world to grind out money for it. If the player can sit around gaining as much power as they want without any consequences, the game is likely to become an unfun slog.
Coming off my complaints about Sky Rogue and its failure to push the player forward, I want to talk about the Risk of Rain series, because I feel that these games have a very unique way of pushing the player forward. Note that I said series, because both Risk of Rain games exist in different genres, but interestingly, these games share a nearly identical progression structure, and this structure has a similar feeling despite the fact that 2D platformers and third-person shooters are very different genres. Most roguelikes increase difficulty over time in distinct chunks. Usually after beating a level or set of levels, the player moves on to a new area that is more difficult. Risk of Rain is unique because instead of tying difficulty to level, difficulty is instead tied to the passage of time. So if I were to sit around on the first level, it would start off pretty easy, but the horde is always getting stronger, and eventually they will become too much to handle and I will die. When the player kills an enemy, they get EXP and gold. Gold is used to open chests, activate shrines, and buy items from shops. Just a quick note about the Risk of Rain shops. These shops are different from most shops because when the player makes a purchase, they can no longer buy items from that shop, even if they have enough money to do so, which really forces the player to choose carefully, and it stops them from getting too many items too quickly. EXP levels up the player, increasing player health and damage for every level, so it is quite valuable. However, it is important to remember that killing enemies takes time, and this will make the game harder later on. Risk of Rain's progression structure is so cool because it creates a conflict between the player's desire to get as powerful as they possibly can and the constantly rising difficulty. If the player wants enough money to buy everything they want, they need to spend some time killing enemies, but the longer they spend powering up, the harder the game will be. Interestingly, running straight for the exit without upgrading much is a completely viable strategy because the player will be fighting easier enemies. But sticking around for a bit to get some useful items is also a viable strategy because the player will be better equipped to deal with the increased difficulty. This is a super cool dynamic and it shows how progression systems don't exist in isolation. Progression systems can interact with difficulty systems, level design, and combat design in fascinating ways, and the Risk of Rain progression system is a great example of that. Like most modern roguelikes, Slay the Spire is a fusion of multiple genres. In this case, Slay the Spire takes influence from deck building games like Dominion and Ascension. Deck building games are all about how your deck changes over the course of a game and they have their own unique progression quirks. Almost every deck builder has some sort of mechanic that lets the player permanently remove cards from their deck, and Slay the Spire is no exception. While in a shop, players can spend money to remove cards from their deck. For people unfamiliar with deck builders, this might seem like a very odd inclusion. After all, who would want to spend their money to remove their hard-earned cards from their deck? Well, as the player goes through the game, they will earn new cards to put into their deck. These cards are almost always more useful than their starting cards, but they can hold the deck back in other ways. A good Slay the Spire deck will usually include synergistic cards that are designed to be more effective played together than they would be on their own. As the number of cards in the deck increases, the odds of drawing any specific card decreases. Additionally, the player can cycle through a smaller deck at a faster speed, meaning that they can play their powerful cards more frequently. This creates a really interesting dynamic, where the player is encouraged to gain power, but gaining the wrong kind of power will hold the player back more so than picking up a non-synergistic item in most other roguelikes. Slay the Spire shows how splitting power up across several cards and forcing the player to use them synergistically changes the progression system. Most roguelikes use a weapon-based progression system, where new weapons or items significantly affect the player's ability. In a weapon-focused roguelike, new weapons tend to come somewhat infrequently, because if the game gave the player a new weapon too often, it might throw the game's balance out of whack. Any individual Slay the Spire card is less powerful than a whole new weapon would be in another roguelike, because these cards were designed to be played synergistically. The game smartly lets the player choose a card after every fight. The abundance of fights means that the player has a lot of opportunities to build interesting combos into their deck. I should also mention that Slay the Spire actually has random encounters similar to the encounters in FTL, but it doesn't suffer from the same issues, because it tells the player what their choices will do. 
the player will never feel like the rug was pulled out from under them in Slay the Spire, which makes the game feel more fair. Instead of guessing what any given option will do, players will make strategic choices about which outcome will be better for their character. Structurally, the Slay the Spire and FTL scenarios are the same, but Slay the Spire shows how giving the player information can change how they interact with those structures. Distributing power through separate pieces also gives the game a lot of variation from run to run. Each character has 75 unique cards to build a deck with, so there are a lot of potential decks. But, because the player can only choose one out of three potential new cards after each fight, the player is forced to improvise with the cards that they are given, which can lead to a lot of interesting decks, even if a lot of those decks are ultimately unsuccessful. I could spend a lot of time talking about every roguelike I have ever played, and how each one tries some new progression structures to try to differentiate themselves, but if I did that, we would be here all day. Change is a fundamental part of games. Heck, it is a fundamental part of the human experience. Storytelling across all mediums is about how the characters or world change in response to conflict. And really, when you think about it, Progression is just describing the ways that a character can change over the course of a game. Roguelike progression systems matter because they are one of the most useful methods to generate meaningful, experiential narrative. I feel that roguelikes specifically are forced to have really unique progression systems because of the genre's core elements. The random levels mean that upgrades cannot be precisely placed within a level like they could in other genres which shifts the onus of progression pacing away from the level designer and onto the system designer. Designers usually want to give players new items, not only to make experiential narratives more interesting, but also to deal with the harder segments later in the game. But developers need to be careful not to give the player too much, otherwise their carefully balanced gameplay might be steamrolled by players, making the game feel too easy. The permanent death might scare a lot of people away from the genre, but it also leads to more interesting progression structures. Nothing in a roguelike is permanent, so developers can build wild progression systems that let the player get more powerful more quickly, because any upgrades the player collects aren't going to be carried across a multi-hour game. As a result, these games can give crazy experiences where the player grows in power exponentially to fight off an increasingly growing challenge, either to emerge from a hard-fought battle victorious, or to see their run brought to an end again. Progression choices can have stakes, because if the player chooses wrong, they might spell their doom. And that just isn't a feeling super common in other genres. Because the player can always try again, perhaps after buying some more items or grinding for more experience points. I guess that's why roguelikes are so special to me. They represent a wide range of possibilities, where different runs might unfold in completely unique ways largely because of their progression systems. Sure, roguelikes are hard, but the joy when you finally master a roguelike systems and beat the game is unmatched. Even if you never make it to the end, you can always take comfort in the fact that roguelikes aren't really about the destination, they're about the journey. And what better way is there to learn about the journey than by learning about progression? Even if you aren't a huge fan of roguelikes, a lot of things I talk about in this video could be applied to other kinds of games. The best way to play should usually be the most fun way to play. Progression can affect other aspects of the game's systems, and providing a wide array of valid choices will lead to more interesting decisions. All of these lessons can be applied in other genres. When I started this project, I had no idea it would get this massive. I guess I had a lot to say about roguelike progression. For those of you who want to take a closer look at the graphs used in this video, there will be a link to all of the graphs in the description. Over the course of planning this video, I realized that this formal structure could be applied to other kinds of games. Metroidvanias are all about how progression and new abilities can interact with level design. Immersive sims need to design progression systems that allow players to approach challenges in a variety of ways. JRPGs typically feature characters who grow in power immensely over the course of a single game. So, fellow content creators, if you feel you would have some unique insight into a game, series, or genre's progression, don't hesitate to send me a message. I have a lot of leftover notes about how these roguelike graphs could be slightly tweaked to better fit other genres, 
and I would be interested to see how this or a similar framework could be applied to other kinds of games. And even if you aren't a content creator, I would love to hear your thoughts about progression in general, or specifically roguelike progression. Uh, leave a comment talking about this. There's definitely a lot of room to talk about progression in games, so I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Additionally, I might be making more of these graphs for other kinds of games in the future, and if I ever do, I'll be tweeting them out on my Twitter. So maybe go follow me there if you want to see more of these graphs in the future. Anyway, this has been Chariot Rider. Have a good day.